Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Carrie Drake, Director of Government Marketing, Maxar. Don't you just love a good marketing sizzle reel? I love that one, but I'm partial. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for joining us. What a wonderful two days. Maxar has been a long-standing supporter of AFSIA and INSA and a trusted government partner for many years. It's programs like this where we come together as a community to discuss our challenges and key mission priorities as well as to learn from our colleagues and peers that are of vital importance. It's only by engaging the full IC workforce, government, military, industry, and academia that we are able to solve the complex problems facing our nation and deliver leading edge solutions that advance our shared national security mission. It's a tremendous privilege to be associated with so many talented and dedicated professionals. Among them is the moderator of today's session who I have the honor of introducing to you. JJ Green is the national security correspondent at WTOP Radio. He reports daily on international security, intelligence, foreign policy, terrorism, and cyber developments, and provides regular on-air analysis on both radio and TV. Green hosts the weekly podcast, The Target USA, which examines the threats facing the US. He also hosts, hosts the weekly broadcast program, The Hunt, and conducts in-depth interviews with experts on ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and other emerging terror threats. He has been embedded with the U.S. military three times in war zones. He is the recipient of the 2017 Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation Award for Distinguished Reporting on National Defense for his series, Anatomy of a Russian Attack. And he has also received a National Edward R. Morrow Award in 2009 for his national security reporting. Welcome, JJ, and I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, I'd like to say first thank you to INSA for inviting me to do this. And secondly, I'd like to say <laughs> that was planned. <laughs> I'm so nervous. Some of you probably know my colleague, Mike Causey, who's one of Washington's most famous journalists, he used to work for the Washington Post. I told him I was doing this a few days ago, and he said, if I were you, I would be scared to death. <laughs> and then Causey told me, he said, look, I've got a safe house down in Dale City or somewhere. He said, you can come and hide out until this thing blows over if you want. <laughs> so Mike, if you're listening, is it too late? Anyway, um, thank you to Ensa for this opportunity. Um, I wanna say the six people that I'm seated next to, um, I have had the pleasure of interviewing every single one of them at least once, with the exception of Vice Admiral Whitworth. And so I kind of feel like this is a bucket list thing today. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and get this started. Um, but before first, I want to say thank you to the public information officers who facilitated um, everything that we needed to do to get prepared for this. And if I screw it up, then just charge it to my head, not my heart. <laughs> All right, Vice Admiral Whitworth, Frank Whitworth, the eighth director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. He leads the NGA under the authorities of the Secretary of Defense, Director of National Intelligence, and he became the director on June 3rd of this year. Dr. Christopher Scalise is next. And by the way, if you don't know already, I'm going from my immediate left all the way to the end. Next person, Dr. <clears throat> Christopher Scalise was appointed by the 19th director, or rather appointed the 19th director of the National Reconnaissance Office on August 1st of 2019. And they provide direction, guidance, and supervision over all matters pertaining to NRO. And he executes and his team other authorities specifically delegated by the Secretary of Defense and the Director of National Intelligence. Next, Mr. David Cohen. He's the Deputy Director 
of CIA. He was also the deputy director of CIA from 2015 to 2017. And Under Secretary uh, uh, for Terrorism and International, or rather Financial Intelligence at the Department of Treasury from 2011 to 2015. Next, Lieutenant General Scott Barrier. He is the 22nd Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Prior to joining DIA, he served in the Department of the Army as the 46th G2. Mr. George Barnes. Mr. Barnes serves as the Deputy Director and Senior Civilian Leader of the U.S. National Security Agency. And having occupied this role since 2017, Mr. Barnes acts as NSA's Chief Operating Officer overseeing strategy, execution, establishing policy, guiding operations, and managing the senior civilian leadership. And last but certainly not least is Mr. Paul Abate. Mr. Abate was named Deputy Director in February of 20, 2021 at the FBI. As the deputy, he oversees all FBI domestic and international investigative and intelligence activities Mr. Abate began his career in March of 1996, assigned to the New York field office where he worked in the criminal division and was also a member of the SWAT team. So let's give them all a round of applause. <clears throat> okay, first question. And what a question. A year ago, most of you were here not sure if you were in the same position, probably not. And um, mm -hmm. my excellent colleague, Olivia Gazis, was sitting in this chair. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you guys were talking about China, talking about Afghanistan. A year has passed, and a whole lot of things have changed. So I want to know what's changed, and how are you dealing with it? And uh, Vice Admiral Whitworth, I'll start with you. And thanks, JJ, and thanks to INSA for everybody uh, being here. Uh, I guess I'm the lucky one. I wasn't here last year. Um, I was serving as the J2 for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and had been doing so. It went uh, over three years, in fact. And so speaking now as the NGA director, uh, I can tell you a lot has changed, uh, to your point. On the, on the 3rd of June, when I uh, assumed this directorship, uh, we were on the 100th day of witnessing an unprovoked invasion by Russia into Ukraine. We're now around the 205th. Um, and I can tell you, uh, previously as a customer, as a reader of NGA's products, uh, culminating with a map that we may have heard about if you've read a couple of different stories about the big green map. It's real. Mm -hmm. uh, the big green map is a culmination of multi-int, but at some point, geospatial reality has to become manifest, made manifest, and, it, and it's that big green map. It still exists to this day. I still carry it everywhere I go. And so do the chairman, for that matter. And the dependency on at least knowing what's happening in the world and where, uh, and especially with regard to Russia, Ukraine, is, is pointed now as it was uh, the day I took the job, and it's, and it's becoming increasingly so. One thing that has not changed, you mentioned China. Uh, I, I would offer that it's as much a pacing threat as it was uh, last year during this forum. And I'm proud to say that before we changed anything relative to the personnel or emphasis, energy, time, money at NGA, before we changed any of that, uh, in the direction of Russia, Ukraine, and monitoring, uh, we had to ensure that we weren't doing so at the expense of our knowledge of China. And then uh, the third thing that I would say is quite pronounced right now, uh, it may not have been talked about as much last year as the role of commercial imag imagery. And this is something that uh, NRO and uh, NGA are really committed to, is ensuring that, uh, to quote one of my old mentors, Vice Admiral Jacoby, we want it all. Uh, whether it's bringing in additional resilience, better coverage, ensuring we've got good pedigree for analysis. Uh, we, we do, we want it all, and we want to make sure we do it the right way, and that's something that within our row we've been really dedicated to. The last change, obviously, is a personnel one. Aside from myself, we've got a new deputy director, and 
uh, Tanya Wilkerson, and she's wonderful coming from NRO. And then we've also got a new command sergeant major, uh, and we've got a new uh, assistant director for operations, Max Pearson. Uh, sergeant major is TJ Baird, and he just rotates everywhere to make sure that our force is taken care of. Perfect. Thank you, Admiral. And I didn't say this, I should have, but it, I will say it now, but you already know this. Um, we're just doing some opening statements for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to dig down into the real questions. But each one of you gets this question for a couple of minutes, and you were right on the money. So thank you. <laughs> Dr. Scalise, please, um, what's changed in the last year for you and your team? Okay, thank you, JJ, and, and thanks, everybody, for, uh, for being here. Um, I think a lot of, of what uh, Admiral Whitworth said is, uh, is applicable. As you know, the NRO is responsible for providing uh, the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance systems uh, from space. Uh, and we deliver that information to our functional managers, NGA, NSA, where it's distributed uh, broadly. Uh, last year at this time, uh, I think we were talking about commercial uh, as something that we, we were doing and we were gonna do. Since then, we have awarded uh, major contracts, expanded it as, as Admiral Whitworth has, has indicated. Uh, but more importantly, I think what's, what's really changed is I, I believe that, that the community overall has seen that it is indeed integrated into our architecture and that it has significant value. Commercial uh, imagery is, is providing significant value, uh, not only in, in allowing us to communicate um, uh, what's going on, but also uh, you know, providing uh, the opportunity for us to focus the national technical means in, in areas where, where that's you know, critically important. Um, so it's, it's, it's proving to be extremely, extremely valuable. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, you know, in the, uh, in the last year, uh, we really got to see what the challenge in space is. Um, we were talking about things, but when Russia did their irresponsible shoot down of, of a satellite, uh, it became clear that the space domain is, is truly a conflicted area and that our, our satellites, our systems, um, are at risk. And uh, the, 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 the international community is taking much more interest in what are the, the norms of operation in space because it's something that we critically need if, if we're going to be, be uh, safe and, and have the opportunity to operate not only our national technical means but our commercial satellites as well. We want to know that that we can operate freely in space uh, and understand what the intents of, of all of the operators in space are. And then third, <clears throat> I would say for us also, it was workforce. Our, our workforce you know, performed incredibly well during the pandemic uh, and coming out of the pandemic to the extent that we are. Uh, we were able to, to grow our workforce, uh, continue to, to recruit, mm. bring in some absolutely fantastic uh, people, uh, new graduates from, from college, our military and, and other government uh, agencies coming in, which is really invigorating the agency. It's also taught us what we learned in the pandemic we can bring forward into the, uh, into the workplace. And, and we're continuing to, to learn and, and uh, take advantage of that to, to improve uh, the work environment as well. Thank you, Dr. Scalise. Next, Deputy Director Cohen, CIA. What's changed for you and your team since last year when, I think you were here last year talking about the Taliban, um, Afghanistan, and China? Yeah. Um, so first, JJ, it's great to be here. It's great to be here among uh, the, my colleagues and, and to have this opportunity uh, to address the, the INSA conference again. Um, I, I think from, from my perspective, um, there's been both continuity and change. Um, the, I'll talk about the continuity in a second. On, on the change front, we did spend a fair amount of time last year talking about Afghanistan and talking about what the, uh, you know, what the future would hold uh, in Afghanistan, particularly for the, the terrorist threat coming out of Afghanistan. Um, and you know, I think as we, as we sit here today, um, I think we are you know, at uh, at sort of the low end of what our expectations were in terms of the terrorist threat from Afghanistan, um, in part because of the, the counterterrorism uh, mission that was uh, undertaken uh, about six weeks ago now, um, where, uh, where the leader of Al-Qaeda was, 
was taken out in downtown Kabul. Um, and but this more generally sort of the the, the sense of what the uh, the terrorist threat coming out of Afghanistan is, whether it's Al Qaeda or ISIS K, um, you know, is in is in you know never uh, sort of counting chickens here, but but in, in relatively good shape right now in terms of threat against the homeland. Um, the other issue that we talked about a fair amount uh, last year was uh, was China, and that and sort of the. There's both continuity and change on that. So within the CIA, we have been pursuing basically four overarching priorities uh, since the beginning of this administration. So China, technology, partnerships, and people. And with respect to China, we have you know, continued to keep our eye on the developments in China, particularly China, Taiwan, but more generally the, the sort of range of, of uh, of threats and competition coming from China. And we have followed through on our, you know, our focus on, on the China issue by standing up a new mission center within CIA, the China Mission Center, which is organizing all of the agency's efforts focused on China. And it, sort of, it is the, the, the center by which we are coordinating across the agency all of our efforts against China. We've been following through on technology as well. Um, we, the other sort of major muscle movement in the agency since we were here last was, the, was standing up a new mission center focused on uh, both transnational and technology threats. Um, so it's the Transnational Technology Mission Center. Um, again, uh, the, the focal point within the agency looking at both transnational issues, so issues of climate change, food insecurity, those sorts of issues, but then also uh, really doubling down on our efforts to uh, to both understand how technology can be used against us and how we can use technology to do our our, our job better. And look, the, and then the final piece that I'll I'll just mention uh, is yeah the one significant global change since we were here last was the uh, you know the the Russian uh, you know, the continued invasion reinvasion of Ukraine, which has drawn a fair amount of attention, I think, from all of us, um, but as well as uh, from us in the agency, where we have, you know, we have flexed. We're an agile agency. We're able to, uh, to, you know, to flex to the challenges of the day uh, and also to stay very, very close to our Ukrainian partners um, throughout the run-up to and, and, the, uh, and now, you know, more than six months into uh, the invasion where we have you know, continued to, uh, to invest in our relationships with our partners in Ukraine in a way that I think has, has paid dividends for us, for sure, and for our policy community in getting insight into <clears throat> what's happening there, and I think also for the Ukrainians. Thank you, sir. Lieutenant General Barrier, um, what's changed since last year for you? JJ, thanks, thanks for being here. Good to see you again. Thanks to the INSA team for having us. Thanks to all of you for being here. Um, you might be interested to know that we have all known each other um, four years and we actually like each other. And I, and I think this is an asymmetric advantage that our intelligence community has that, that others don't. So it's, it's very interesting to ponder. Um, JJ, I'll start with what hasn't changed. And so what, what hasn't changed is DIA is still responsible for foundational military intelligence ac across the globe uh, for the Department of Defense. We do that through our, our great global footprint, through our defense attache network. Um, our bases, and then also through our, our uh, combatant commands, which we, we man all other J2 shops. So that, that hasn't changed. Um, the other thing that hasn't changed is China, still, still the pacing threat. And when I describe China to our workforce and to others, I talk about it as a, an emerging crisis. And we can all see the rise of China, how their military capabilities have, uh, have developed over time and everything that they're doing um, in every domain. And so that, that is a constant for us, and we're focusing on that, and I'll come back to that in a second. But, um, but on the Russia-Ukraine crisis, I would just say that has been a huge focus for us this year. And with uh, our teammates on the Joint Staff J2 and our teammates in uh, the UCOM uh, J2 team and NATO partners, we have been heavily engaged. Uh, we stood up this thing called the Integrated Crisis Group Russia. Uh, a lot of officers involved in situational understanding and situational awareness and then, and then sharing that um, with our Ukrainian partners and others uh, to bring the, the power of the United States uh, to, this, to this effort. And so that's been huge for us and, and very, very consuming. I think the second, the second thing that I'd like to chat about is just partnerships. 
And we have doubled down on, on partnerships across the globe to include in the Indo-Pacific, um, within NATO, uh, partners in Europe and, and all over to really, really expand what it is we're doing so that we can put a little O for operationalization in, into DI so that we can bring effects uh, to, uh, to intelligence support for the department. And then lastly, I think, um, we have undergone a reorganization in DIA. I, I talked a little bit about it last year. We created a deputy director for global integration. Uh, that's one, one senior who is responsible for integrating the, the efforts and effects of the entire agency uh, so that we're all, we're all unified and we're using our resources uh, to the best uh, we can. And then, and then like the CIA, we have stood up this thing called the China Mission Group um, to really do the same thing, uh, to, to synchronize our efforts on the, on the China uh, Taiwan problem, and we'll be we'll be prosecuting that uh, from here on out. It'll it'll go into effect uh, uh, next month, and we'll build it we'll build it as we go. So I think uh, those are primarily the things that have changed. AJ, thanks. Thank you, Director. <coughs> Deputy Director Barnes, NSA. What's Wait. changed since since last year? Uh, a lot has changed, and other things have not changed. And so if I look back at uh, last September, it was really a, a pivotal moment for us. We had spent over 20 years uh, working with protecting forces forward in Afghanistan. And we were very anxious about getting them out safely and then the condition we left in Afghanistan uh, for them as well as for our global security. Uh, I think one of the things that we wanted to do and needed to do and we've done to a great degree thus far is prove to ourselves that we could distribute our focus more globally to, to confront those challenges that we're all talking about beyond the focus on terrorism threats to our nation, our homeland, our allies, but also to deal with the emerging and evolving threats post against us by China and Russia and some of their other friends. Uh, we were anxious, can we do that and sustain the counterterrorism focus that we've had? And uh, we have proven that, we continue to prove that. Mm -hmm. All of us are locked in this journey. We will continue and so just as uh, David mentioned, August was an example, there are others. Uh, we will continue that battle and it might not have all the fanfare that it had, but it is happening day in, day out behind the curtains. And so we will bring uh, people to justice if they threaten us. Beyond that, at the time of last September, we were dealing with the aftermath of other things that have confronted our nation. Uh, Russian pursuits against us through the solar winds penetrations. Uh, China's work trying to exploit uh, Microsoft Exchange servers. You may have heard of the Hafnium exploits. Uh, dealing with those, trying to attribute them, trying to understand the degree to which they affected our society, not just our government. Uh, and that was really on the, the heels of us trying to stand up a response to that that gets to uh, the whole thing that Scotty mentioned with respect to partnerships. Uh, and one of the things we did last year was stand up our Cybersecurity Collaboration Center, which was purpose built to actually have a new type of engagement with industry and our cybersecurity mission partners across our government and governments wide, worldwide. So those were big, big shifts. Uh, and then on top of that, as was mentioned, we had the little surprise of Russia and their aspirations for Ukraine. And I think, again, we are all friends. We don't just act like it up here. We work day in and day out together. We try to leverage each other's authorities, capabilities to get a synchrony of action and impact on adversaries that would uh, put risk on us or our allies. And so we're trying to do that in spades. We feel the pressure of it every day, but um, I think it's Russia is an example of that really working well. Another big focus we have, as was mentioned, is workforce. Um, I'm delighted to know that uh, our booth, at NS NSA booth out here is getting a lot of attraction uh, yesterday and today. That's good because we need good people. Um, we've just, on the back end of uh, hiring about 2,000 people this year, we have a bigger goal next year. It's a daunting challenge to hire that many people who not only are bringing their skills, but can get through our clearance process. So, <laughs> and, and that's hard because the threat is there. The threat is among us. And we are trying to mi be mindful of the fact that being an open society, that's the strength that we project, but it also creates weaknesses. And so we have to make sure that our security apparatus evolves at the pace of need. And so the workforce of the future has many choices. And one of the things we're confronting is the fact that people don't want to wait to go through the clearance process. They, want to, they don't want to come into a skiff to work. Um, they want to be educated after they get with us, not just before they get to us. And so we are wrestling with all those dynamics that the new workforce uh, presents to us and trying to be responsive and to actually re-engineer the way we engage with our future. Thank you, Drew. Deputy Director Barnes. Uh, Mr. Abate, um, how, is, how has life changed for you and your team at the FBI? Thank you. 
Thank you, JJ. Great to see you. Uh, thank you to the INSA team for inviting us all back, and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, so much of the territory has been covered already uh, by partners here. Um, I think in terms of the threat, um, it's remained very consistent and persistent, as has already been uh, reflected in the remarks. Within that, the, the actors have changed uh, in part the form, the avenues of approach that the threats, uh, the actors are coming at us, the places where that's occurring in part uh, have changed. But I think it's from the FBI perspective important to look at it from both a short term and a long term uh, perspective. Uh, we're very focused, we remain so on in the short term, uh, you know, preventing loss of life as we are, as we all are here in defending our country. When I think about that, I think about uh, terrorism and our efforts in countering terrorism primarily. It's a no-fail mission, obviously a life and death proposition. And when we look across the world, uh, it's a really a more dangerous environment that we're in today than it was a year ago from our perspective based on what we're seeing. Uh, terrorists and terrorist organizations are more widely dispersed through affiliates uh, and associated groups around the world. Uh, we have renewed safe havens Afghanistan, as an example, uh, where terrorists uh, have a greater ability now to plot and plan and remain intent on attacking us here and hurting and killing people. There's no doubt uh, about that. So we have to stay focused on that in the short term, first and foremost, uh, to ensure uh, that we, we protect human life, number one. And then in the longer term, uh, going back to the counterintelligence uh, that, uh, threat that was noted here, uh, nation state adversaries like China, Russia, North Korea, uh, Iran uh, have continued to be unrelenting in their efforts to attack uh, and undermine our country and our democracy. Uh, and really when you look at that, um, it doesn't pose the immediate urgent threat of physical harm in all instances, but it's more so uh, the risk and what we're seeing, the erosion of our national security, our economic security, uh, and our way of life, really, and that's that's an even greater fight. So, from the FBI perspective, um, we're even more focused on that uh, than ever. Uh, we have recalibrated and reevaluated uh, our resourcing on that, and we've done some shifts without losing focus in the short term in the counterterrorism uh, mission. But we're looking out uh, into the future as well, along with all the partners here, uh, to make sure that we're defending our country to the utmost, ensuring that there isn't any further erosion and the things I mentioned, economic, national security, uh, and, the, uh, and, and uh, the democratic principles that we live under here. Um, and then, as George noted, more on the business side, uh, the challenges have remained the same in terms of hiring. Uh, we're all working hard uh, to make sure that we reach out to uh, and recruit uh, the best talent with the right skills that meet the criteria that we need to bring into our agencies in departments to do the work and, and carry the mission uh, forward. We're fortunate, as was noted, to have consistency, I think, in leadership, both uh, you know, at, at the highest level and within the workforce uh, itself. Uh, it's important you know, to, 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 you know, to carry on the understanding, the experience, and not, in order to not repeat the mistakes uh, of the past and take the lessons learned and apply them uh, so we can work more efficiently to counter the threats we face uh, going forward. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you, JJ. Thank you, Mr. Evade. Um, I want to jump into some, 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 some questions for each of you, specific to you. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but it's something that absolutely has to be brought up, uh, and that is Russia. We've talked about it a little bit today, and I'm not trying to make this a complete conversation about that, but I, I want to start with you, Director Barrier, about Russia specifically, you know, when this whole phase of the invasion on February 24th began, um, you know, you, you knew, most of, all of you knew what Russia was up to, at least to some degree. It was pretty clear by that intelligence that was declassified and put out there. But I'm interested in knowing what you think Russia has now going for it because we realized they basically were demasked. You know, they, they, they've been shown not to be that big military 
<laughs> juggernaut that everybody, or at least some people, thought they were. And some of your international colleagues have said that they really are running out of time and running out of people, running out of resources. So I'm interested in thinking, interested in asking what you think, what DIA thinks about how long Russia continues to do this. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. It's occupying uh, a lot of time uh, for the folks uh, here on stage. I, I would I would just say that um, I believe the Russians plan for an occupation, not necessarily an invasion. And uh, that has set them back uh, because they underestimated uh, the Ukrainian will to fight, and the Ukrainians have done really, really well, and they're doing really well right now. Um, this, is, uh, this is really tough for the Russians because they've expended a lot of resources. They've not yet mobilized. And so they're coming to a point right now where I think um, uh, Putin may have to reevaluate what his objectives are uh, for this operation because it's pretty clear right now at a steady state he's not going to be able to achieve what he initially intended to do. And so I think he's, uh, he's coming to some decisions. What those decisions will be, we don't know, but that will largely drive how long this conflict uh, lasts. Uh, I, I think we're going into a long winter, and uh, we'll, we'll see how, how both sides emerge. I think the, the interesting thing is how the international community has coalesced around Ukraine and the support that they have given Ukraine and, and really the intelligence that we've, we've helped with uh, in this situation. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. The international community has definitely jumped in and done what Ukraine needed. If any of you want to chime in on that question or a question, please just raise your hand or just say something. Let me know. Uh, we, we, I, were, we were you know, basically joined at the hip uh, for the last year on this issue. And so I'll just offer, uh, I concur with uh, General Barrier, uh, impossible inflection point, however, um, a historical approach to this uh, is also uh, an important uh, kind of reminder that it's not over. Uh, if you look at most of the efforts undergone uh, in the military domain by Russia over the last 100 years, they normally start poorly. And they become an, a learning organization and they adjust. Uh, so uh, I think to Director Barrier's point, they've got a possible adjustment in store, and we'll have to see what comes next. Uh, we're going to be vigilant no matter what they decide. Okay. Um, thank you very much, um, Vice Admiral Whitworth. Uh, so Direct Deputy Director Barnes, a part of what Russia's done in Ukraine in another, in another way, maybe in another lifetime, is something that they as a part of the Soviet Union would like to have done to the United States or other countries, but they can't, they won't. And so what they're doing is other things. I spoke with the defense minister from Estonia yesterday and asked him when, how Russia would retaliate for what has happened in the last few days. And he said the same thing they've always been doing, it's cyber attacks. And we know that Russia based on the intelligence that you, your organizations put out there a few years ago, was heavily involved in our elections in 2016. So the question I'd like to ask you is, what are you doing now? Because um, we've got another midterms coming up. We've got another presidential election coming up a couple years. What are you doing now to position your agency to do the best that it can to help the U.S.? Certainly. Um, so first and foremost, Throughout the continuum, um, we are we have our eyes and ears. We do the ears; they do the eyes. <laughs> um, but we ha we are are focused on the cybersecurity risks that they pose to the Ukrainians, but also to to us and our allies. Uh, that has been there; it continues to be there. The calculus of its application is something that we continue to try to look for because I think uh, many of you will recall back in January there were a few. Um, actions that were exerted by the Russians against the Ukrainians <clears throat> before the 24th. And we thought that foretold the story of a, a greater, more cataclysmic pursuit on critical infrastructure, their power grid, their transportation, and those types of things. Um, that didn't happen to the degree we expected. Uh, we are looking at what was the calculus uh, and to the point of uh, General Barrier, they were looking for an occupation. And so that colored their calculus with respect to the level of destruction because they, ex they expected to actually roll in and operate and they didn't want to bring down something that they in turn needed to use the next day. Mm -hmm. And so fast forward to now, well, what does it mean as they get frustrated? Uh, things aren't working out too well on the ground. And so we continue to watch for indicators that they will exert influences, capabilities, technology that they have had um, 
you know, I think all of the efforts that have played out with the Ukrainian pushback uh, has actually jolted the Russian system a bit. Mm. And so they are extremely capable, as we've seen their operations against us and others, and they can be. Uh, we have to continue to try to pry open the secrets that they're holding to really understand the calculus of application of capability by just having it. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we have a midterm election coming up, right? And so just like in the last several cycles, again, we are continuing to look at that uh, across all of us to make sure that as they're working on Ukraine, don't ever uh, think that they aren't working influence so here at home. That's one of the big questions. Um, what kind of capacity do they have to do anything else? Just briefly, and anybody can answer this, what kind of capacity do they have left to engage in the kind of aggressive behavior against the rest of the world now that they've been hit so hard in Ukraine, embarrassed so many times on the world stage? Uh, and certainly, I know that there are questions to some degree inside Russia about the leadership and where it goes. Yep, so, so I would just, to the capacity, point, of course, the, the capacity against Ukraine is the governmental apparatus as well as those that they hire. Um, the capacity against elections has been a lot of hired services. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been their MO. They continue to do that. And so it's up to us to uncover that, expose that, and thwart it together through exposure as well as other types of pushback. And so sure. that's what we're doing collectively. Sure. Uh, Deputy Director Cohen, um, you know, I want to connect this to the pacing challenge that you and a couple of your colleagues have talked about with reference to China. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to know if there are any lessons learned from this Russia-Ukraine situation that inform how you think about that pacing challenge with China and also China's wanton <laughs> looks at Taiwan, mm -hmm. you know? How's, how, does, how, does, how does this Russia situation, Russia-Ukraine situation informed how you view yeah. any possibility of concern in Taiwan from China? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. We are watching very carefully, uh, in particular, how the Chinese are understanding the, the situation in, in Ukraine, how the, how the Russians have performed, how the Ukrainians have performed, uh, and the implications of that for for their own uh, plans, uh, as as they may be for Taiwan, what well, what we know is that is that President Xi has uh, has told his military that by 2027 he wants to have the capability to take Taiwan by force if they choose to do so. He has not made a decision. Our assessment is not that he has made no decision to do that, but that he has asked his military to put him in a position where, uh, where if that's what he wanted to do, uh, he would be able to. I think it's still the assessment of the community, the intelligence community as a whole, that, that Xi's uh, interest in Taiwan is to, is to get control of Taiwan essentially through non-military means. But on the military side of things, I think we are watching very carefully the lessons that, that have been learned, including you, know, you have a Russian military that has, you know, had not seen combat, uh, certainly on this level, in many, many years. The same is true for the, for the PLA, for the Chinese military. So I think one of the questions that we are looking at is whether, whether she is sort of taking uh, the lesson that a, you know, that a military that hasn't really been uh, you know, in combat, hasn't seen, hasn't been, uh, you know, stressed, in the way that the, the Russian military is being stressed in Ukraine, you know, how much confidence he can have in his own military going forward. You know, and then, look, on the, on the Taiwan side, you know, sort of the analog to Ukraine, I think we're also, uh, you know, assessing the ability of Taiwan to defend itself, both to deter uh, the Chinese from, uh, from trying to move militarily or otherwise. Uh, and then, you know, if necessary, to defend itself, and how the how the Taiwans are thinking about that in relation to uh, what has gone on in Ukraine. So there are a lot of lessons. Okay. And one last point, you know, as you know, everybody has made clear that the 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 lessons to come out of Ukraine are, uh, you know, it's not over. There's still more lessons to be learned. And I think as 
as that uh, conflict continues, um, I think both the Chinese, the United States, and others will uh, will continue to draw lessons from there that will have applicability uh, in the in the China Taiwan context. I think there's another piece that just to build on that. Um, China is watching very closely how this is playing out, right? Mm -hmm. And and one of the most powerful things we have is we have a coalition of nations that are exerting pressure on Russia for its behavior. Um, and, and that has many ramifications, imminent and long-term. Uh, China is much more interconnected globally. Uh, and so they are gonna be thinking very hard about the repercussions beyond the physical force piece, yeah. um, the repercussions in their global situation of, of making moves like that. And so I think they're watching very closely uh, at how this is playing out and what the, the pushback has been, not just from you know those of us that are su supplying support directly to the Ukrainians, but the broader community with uh, economic leverage. Interesting point. Um, 10 seconds. Yes, sir. Yeah, just uh, I wanna underscore one thing. Um, I think the conflict uh, involving Russia and Ukraine has underscored the value of warning. Uh, there have been times that we've been in venues like this in the last decade where people said warning was broken. I think it reinforced that, uh, that a strong sense of warning and dedication to warning can actually uh, be one of your most important assets. We want to know uh, and be able to warn if competition's moving into conflict. Okay, thank you. Deputy Director of BAIT, and then I'm coming to you, Dr. Scalise, I've got some specific space questions specifically, but uh, Deputy Director of BAIT, um, you talked about um, the short and long-term perspective, having that, and knowing you for a few years, you're very deliberate and very careful about pretty much everything that I know professionally about you, <laughs> and thinking about things very carefully is important. Um, I need to ask this question, though. The FBI itself here domestically has come under, for lack of a better word, withering attacks from a number of um, groups, organizations. And there are those that believe that some of this is driven by foreign misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, whatever you want to call it. Um, what I'd like to, to hear you engage on a bit is to give us a little bit of insight about how the FBI is preparing itself, because it's, you know, th th this may be me getting ahead of myself, but just based on what we see, it may get worse before it gets better. <clears throat> so I'm just wondering how your team and you and all of the leadership are preparing for the next two, four, six years uh, of what we've seen, uh, or what we might see, rather. Uh, we're focused on that now, uh, and we have been. Um, I think it's important to frame it historically. Um, we do, we, in, in the work we do uh, on behalf of the nation through the Bureau, uh, much of it is uh, sensitive in nature, uh, spanning from public corruption uh, to counterintelligence uh, investigations. Uh, so the type of uh, things that we hear now, <clears throat> I think have always occurred over time, but they're more so in front of us all uh, through the media and social media and uh, you know the various platforms uh, and the prominence of those now. So the way we approach that, JJ, is um, we do the work by the book. Uh, we focus on the facts and the evidence objectively and neutrally in, in everything that we do. That's the bottom line. It doesn't matter what type of intelligence we're focused on collecting or what types of investigations we're carrying out, that's the bottom line. That's how Director Ray approaches it, that's how I approach, approach it, that's how our leadership team approaches it, and that's how our workforce approaches it. We have very rigorous standards uh, within the Department of Justice and the FBI, um, very strict guidelines uh, at all levels that we operate uh, under that are encircled by the law and the Constitution, and we, you know, rigor rigorously strive to adhere to those uh, in everything that we do uh, each and every day. We have had instances uh, where we know uh, people have done bad things. It's like any organization. Uh, they've committed misconduct. They've gone outside of policy. Uh, they've even gone outside of the law in some uh, instances. They've made 
uh, mistakes. We work hard to ensure every day that that does not happen. Number one, through training, uh, we've implemented you know, additional policies and procedures based on lessons learned. We think through and apply those lessons learned each and every day in everything that we do and every decision uh, that's made. Uh, and when people, the, the very small few that may go astray, we hold them accountable so, uh, to, to, the, to the absolute degree. So just one follow up very quickly. Do you think that, I mean, a lot of what you, what you said basically is we're seeing a lot of what's taking place now because of, well, basically cameras everywhere. You know, everybody's got mobile phones and social media and, you know, not to say that, you know, people with cameras and, and phones are responsible for us knowing all these things, but, but, but a lot, there's a lot more focus on these things than before because the information wasn't out there. Plus there's the pace of change too that has driven a lot of information that we get that we didn't get before. But do you think that the issues that the FBI are facing in, in any part are in, in part because of foreign actors trying to drive us learning more about these things, seeing more about these things, whether they're true or not? I, I, absolutely. It's hard to assess to what to degree that's occurring or exists, but there's no doubt that uh, all the adversary, all the nation state adversaries that we've already talked about here are certainly uh, to some degree um, pursuing that avenue to, you know, sow discord, undermine cause harm to the U.S. government, to departments and agencies, including ours within that, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. And we're on the lookout that, for that each and every day through the work we do, the intelligence, the information we collect, and we look to counter that uh, when we yeah. can. Thanks. Dr. Scalise, talk about space for a minute. Um, it used to be a very different place, you know. <laughs> it was a very exclusive, and, and still to today, it's still a pretty exclusive <clears throat> domain. Not every country can send people there and explore space, but it's become a bit more hostile uh, and it's become a bit more important um, than most folks thought of in the past. So just give us an assessment of what it's like in space now, what you see there, and what your role is in making sure the U.S. has everything it needs in terms of dealing with that domain. Certainly. Um, well, our role is basically the same as it's been for, for 60 years which is to provide the overhead um, ISR that the nation needs, and, and, uh, and we continue to do that. But you're right, the, the environment has changed significantly in good ways and in, and in not so good ways. Um, uh, on the good side, uh, what we've seen over, certainly over the last 10 years and, and perhaps uh, you know, more, more in an accelerated way in the last five years, is the cost of launch drop considerably. And that's opened up uh, avenues for a lot of additional capabilities in space. Um, communications, uh, we're, we're seeing more where you, know, you can, you can uh, almost use a cell phone to communicate anywhere, anywhere around the globe now because we can, we, we can get connectivity. Um, and, and that's a good thing. It also offers us the opportunity to, uh, for the bad things that are going on, which is people are trying to deny the United States its use of space to allow us to build a more resilient architecture. Um, so as the cost of, of space, of launch has gone down, uh, other companies have come along and developed spacecraft, almost commodity spacecraft, not quite there yet, but, but close, uh, certainly you know, lower cost than we've seen before, which has allowed us to proliferate our architectures. Um, and, and to provide a, a basic capability um, that will be resilient to uh, various forms of attack so that we can provide uh, the ISR that the nation needs uh, without having to, uh, to, to, to worry about a total loss uh, as we would if we only had a few things up there. Uh, also, the, the commercial world uh, as if you go out here now and you, you see a number of commercial companies that are providing capabilities from space. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, commercial imagery, commercial RF now is, is becoming available, offering us much better opportunities to, uh, to, uh, to expand our, our, our look and, and to expand our, our ability to share data and 
to reduce the burden on national systems so they can be focused uh, on areas where you need um, either a very different capability uh, or a very exquisite capability, um, which, which we can go off and provide. <clears throat> and finally, I would say on the, on really on the challenging side, <clears throat> in particular Russia and China, but, but other you know, state and non-state actors um, are actively engaged in doing things. Um, it, it's pretty low cost, uh, unattributable, unattributable to, to go off and, and conduct uh, you know, cyber uh, operations. Uh, we work very hard, all of us, you know, no matter where you are in, in industry or government, uh, it's a continuing uh, uh, fight to stay ahead of, of the cyber actors. Uh, so that's one, but we're also seeing, uh, particularly with China, the capability to develop uh, counter space weapons, uh, both ASATs, things in space, Russia is there as well uh, to deny our, our ability to operate. So we have to design systems that are resilient to those attacks. And what I'll, the last thing I'll say is um, we're demonstrating that not only on the ground and what we do in space, but also with our partners. We have great partners. Certainly everybody here are great partners uh, working with. We work very closely with the Space Force and Space Command uh, to assure that we have space domain awareness and we understand what's going on. But also our international partners are absolutely critical. In the last year, we had six launches. Um, three of them were not from the traditional place, right? Typically, we launch from uh, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station and Vandenberg Space Force Station. Uh, now we've launched from Wallops Island in Virginia, uh, and we've had two launches from uh, uh, New Zealand uh, to go off and demonstrate it, and later this year we'll have a launch from the United Kingdom. So our partners are an incredible asset to, to what we have, and, and I think you, you, know, you see that with Russia and China. You don't see the same, same degree of, of, of partnership and the same, same unity outside of their country as we do. So I would say those things, space, fortunately, the, the commercial sector, the launch, has brought down the cost of space. That's allowed us to do many things that, that, that we want to go off and do. Uh -huh. um, and then we have uh, you know, a somewhat traditional one with cyber, but we're seeing much more in the way of uh, activity in space and then our partnerships just add to our, our capabilities. Isn't it crazy how fast time goes? <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we have a shrinking amount of time. So obviously that's always the case. Um, but I want to get to some audience questions because we have another 15 minutes or so here and make sure that um, you guys who are absolutely the most important get your opportunity. So this first question is to everybody. Um, and please feel free to you know, keep it short <clears throat> so that everybody can weigh in. How are your agencies using open source information to enhance the insights provided by classified intelligence? What technologies are you using to make sense of all the available data? I'm not gonna put a time limit on that, but I'm just gonna say, if you could just give each other an opportunity to have everybody answer. Um, Director Whitworth, you wanna start that? No, it's a great question. It's, uh, I was just listening to uh, Dr. Scalise and the, you know, I, I had a feeling this question was coming. <laughs> As he launches more stuff and uh, buys more pixels, it puts an imperative on what are you going to do with all that and how are you going to make sense of it. Yeah, I've written that um, I think we're in a reluctant uh, revolution in military affairs or RMA, <coughs> and part of what makes that hard is something I call deluge control. <coughs> what are we going to do with the, the deluge of data, the deluge of information? Accordingly, I think the, uh, the Secretary of Defense and Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security uh, have been wise to uh, ask us to get ready to inherit a program called MAVEN. Uh, this program has been uh, dedicated to uh, the integration of artificial intelligence and machine learning for try to get, basically trying to get ahead of deluge control. Uh, it's imperative. It's, it's almost existential, frankly, to the business, uh, certainly in geospatial intelligence. And I think we'll, you know, we'll, we're going to be sharing. Uh, this is going to be a foundry for a lot of different applications. CDAO uh, at, uh, at uh, the Department of Defense is going to take some portions of this portfolio, but for the geospatial piece where we have just tons and tons of data, we need, tri we, uh, we need good triage and good queuing from good algorithms. So that's our plan. Okay, let's go to you. Uh 
Director Cohen, uh, Deputy yep. Director Cohen first, <clears throat> and then we'll come back to Great. Uh, Dr. Scalise. Yeah, I'll just say two, two quick things. One, we have uh, an open source enterprise as part of the agency that is responsible for deriving from the you know, enormous quantity of open source information that is available in the foreign field, um, insights that we feed into our, our analytic work. We are an all source uh, analytic agency. We rely on the intelligence uh, produced by our partners and we rely on open source information as well. The, the technology that we need in order to derive the, the insights out of, uh, out of that you know, mass of information is you know, in part the artificial intelligence, uh, actually in large part artificial intelligence, as well as other, other technologies. So part of what I was mentioning just before our emphasis on technology is it one lane in that is to make sure that we are well positioned to uh, to to derive this uh, these insights. The other piece I will just say on open source is with the explosion of open source information, um, it it so reinforces the focus that we have on our human intelligence mission and bearing down in the, what is sort of the, the most difficult of our tasks, which is you know, spotting, assessing, recruiting, and running assets who provide uh, human intelligence, making sure that as we undertake that very difficult and dangerous mission, both for the asset as well as for our officers, that we are focused on what we really need to obtain through human intelligence uh, as we are you know, taking in other forms of intelligence, including open source. Okay, and I realize as well, some of you may not want to answer that question, and if it's okay. Um, I'll jump in. <laughs> yeah. Um, General Barrier, did you want to answer that or no? I'll just, just a couple of quick points. In 1976, Lieutenant General Sam Wilson, former DI director, said 70% of everything we do is from the open source, 1976. It's a lot more than that today. Um, DIA has been designated as the Defense Intelligence Enterprise Manager for open source for the entire DOD. And that is a thousand flowers blooming that uh -huh. we're trying to, uh, to get our hands around. So for DIA, uh, those authorities allow me to convene a meeting, uh, but I can't tell the service secretary what to do. Uh, but what we can do is provide standards on, on training, tradecraft, um, policy guidance, uh, how we do this, what we buy, how much we pay for it. And we're, we're developing tools as we speak. We're in close partnership with our, our teammates at the CIA as we do this together. It's, it's really one team with their operation in our open source intelligence center. So we're moving forward very rapidly. Okay. Deputy Director Barnes. I'll just say that um, we use it for all types of functions uh, to, as leads, but also to fill in blanks. And then invariably as we have situations where uh, nation state or non nation state actors do bad things, uh, open source avails a digital trail. And so if you look at 60 Minutes did a piece on Navalny and, uh, or CNN and 60 Minutes has done another piece, different open source focused firms have actually used the digital footprints we all leave behind to piece together cases that can corroborate intel we may or may not have and allow us to point to direct attribution to bring people to justice and have culpability um, sometimes faster and sometimes when we couldn't have it any other way. And so it's a force multiplier that actually we need to and we are tapping into as a community. Okay. Um, Mr. Abate, um, it's kind of hard to tell if you're interested in answering that or not, but I will. I'll, I'll just ask you, <laughs> do you want to? Uh, look, it's a huge challenge uh, from a number of perspectives, le perspectives legal, policy, uh, technology, with the volume of, and proliferation of information that's out there publicly and in open source. With that challenge, it's also a great opportunity because as just was pointed out by George, it helps us identify threats that are coming at us and it helps us build out the threat picture uh, as well. So we all, as has been noted, work closely on developing the tools and technologies to deal with that volume and gain access uh, to that information. But it's all interconnected. It's not just here within government. The private sector plays a huge role uh, in that in the public. So I, this is just one perspective on it, but from a, from a, you know, terrorism, a violence threat perspective, which we're focused on every day, um, even going beyond the national security realm in terrorism, but 
mass shootings, things like that. <clears throat> the public plays a huge role in terms of <clears throat> looking at everything that's out there and identifying those threats and indicators and bringing them to us. We have a public access line um, that takes e-tips and uh, phone calls and we average uh, over 4,000 calls and tips per day. <clears throat> Most of those, when resolved, turn out to be nothing, but there's so many instances that aren't even talked about or highlighted each and every day where we've been able to work with partners uh, in the IC and in you know, state, local, federal law enforcement to go out and disrupt things that would have otherwise happened and prevent people from being harmed. And that's, uh, the, that, that reflects the value of the information that's out there and just one way that we're dealing with it uh, and using it to leverage and help us uh, achieve the mission. Okay, um, I want to jump to the workforce, um, and part of the reason why I want to do that is because a lot of folks here <laughs> are, have a, a, a vested interest in this. So, um, and I also realize we have a bit more time than I thought we did, so that's good. So, more <laughs> questions. But uh, this workforce question, um, regarding workforce goals, what are your agency's skill, skill gaps? What are your what is your strategy to bring the next generation workforce on board? <coughs> Dr. Scalise, you want to go with that? Sure, yeah. Um, so we're actually really excited. We, we had a, a really uh, good recruiting year and, and a good, good set of interns that, uh, that were able to come in. And I, I don't know, many people don't know that the NRO um, originally did not have its own workforce, uh, but about six, a little more than six years ago, uh, that came up. and. Uh, uh, it's it's really been been coming uh, to the fore. So, so what are the areas that we're interested in? Well, pretty much everything, um, <laughs> as you can you can imagine, uh, because of what we do. Clearly, our focus is on the technology side. We need engineers and scientists uh, to go off and and conceive of of the systems that um, uh, that we build. But we need financial, legal, uh, and and others to. Uh, uh, public affairs to, to, to help us uh, get our job done. Some of the areas that we're really looking at um, and, and see that, uh, that we need uh, collectively um, uh, in order to, to focus more on, uh, we were talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning and they've sort of become buzzwords. Um, but what we really need is, is we're, we're amassing a lot of data. We're collecting a lot of data in, in space. We're operating larger constellations. We're operating dissimilar systems. So we really need uh, uh, engineers and scientists and mathematicians that can operate on large volumes of data, make sense out of it, uh, establish algorithms that will allow NGA, NSA to uh, task our systems. Um, and, and you have to think, when, once you start getting large constellations, you don't say, point this at that. It's going to be give me information on X, uh, and we have to go off and work that. Okay. So we we really need uh, need uh, engineers and scientists that that can go off and work that. Okay. And then of course I think everybody probably because I think we all compete against each other, <laughs> even though we're friends, <laughs> is the uh, cybersecurity world <laughs> um, to to get uh, to get more in in that area. Uh, but frankly, this is a very good time to, to bring people in. Then I just want to add one other thing, uh, being in the intelligence community. Um, uh, we're in a digital revolution, uh, as has been said. That's allowing us to do things much more efficiently than we ever did it before. And it's going to change our workplace, yeah. because we're going to have to be able to go off and, and allow things that we hadn't thought about before, like uh, you know, Bluetooth in the factory so that we don't have to go off and say, okay, what's this voltage measurement and write it down on a piece of paper. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're off looking at how we're gonna go off and implement those types of things as well. Um, Admiral Whitworth, um, I know you have some things to say about AI and machine learning as well, and I'm interested in how, how critical are those areas to your work right now? So uh, this goes back to Maven, and, um, and notwithstanding uh, whenever we are directed, we're preparing to have a transition from USDI to NGA for Maven so that we take responsibility for the Maven program. And that means uh, the foundry of the algorithm, but also its application to the deluge of geospatial intelligence. Uh, so 
This comes down to having too much information, too little time, too few people, and how do you ensure you're triaging and cueing attention? Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the, uh, the future of NGA, and I would hazard a guess uh, most of the people on this stage as well. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you wouldn't <clears throat> mind, on the workforce sure. itself. Yes. Uh, so for people who are going to help us with this sense making, yes, absolutely, geodesists, data scientists, photogrammetric experts, people in the geospatial sciences. What's exciting is what's happening in places like uh, St. Louis, where uh, we have identified as we have a new military construction project <coughs> in a pretty tough area of town that needs some regeneration, a, a way to bring in the academic community uh, and civic leaders uh, to say, okay, for that child in that neighborhood who sees across the fence, how do I work in there? Scholarships established by a consortium of schools on the, on the geospatial sciences uh, to say, yeah, a, there's a way for you to work across the fence. And that's, uh, that's what I hope going to be a beacon on the hill for a lot of, uh, a lot of communities and a lot of elements of <clears throat> IC. Okay. Anybody else that wants to weigh in on the workforce question, do so at any time. I've got a couple of specific questions for people that have been asked by the audience. Mr. Direct, Deputy Director Cohen, I'm going to come to you first with this one. There's one for you that says, Mr. Cohen, as the U.S. Intel, uh, Intel and, and weapons help Ukraine um, become more decisive in this fight, is the risk of Russia using WMD going up? I'm going to come back to the uh, workforce issue, answer this question first. Look, I think as we are watching what's happening in Ukraine and the, the, you know, the, the recent uh, advances that the Ukrainians have made, particularly in the north, in Kharkiv, but you know, also uh, mounting an offensive in the south, the, the questions are, I think, going to be asked by, uh, by Putin of his, of his military leaders, sort of what's happening, why is it happening, what, what can we do to, uh, uh, you know, to push back and to, you know, retain our position and, and as well to, uh, to try to follow through on his, his ambition. I don't think we should underestimate either Putin's adherence to his original uh, objective here, which was to control Ukraine. Um, I don't think we have any reason to believe that he is moved off of that objective or his risk appetite. We should not underestimate his risk appetite. That being said, I, we have not seen sort of concrete evidence of, you know, of planning for use of any uh, WMD, but we're, we're obviously sharply focused on, on that question. Okay. Um, can well, I say one word about the workforce? Yes, just briefly. Yeah. I realize we're running out of time again. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so, yeah. Go ahead, sir. All, all I want to say is that, as I mentioned at the outset, we have four priorities at the agency, uh, overarching priorities, China, technology, partnerships, and people. On that last piece, on the people piece, we have been working extraordinarily hard to ensure that the, the work environment at the CIA is one where we are both able to attract people, get them on board more quickly, and retain them. We are very focused on wellness across the board at the agency, which means both taking care of the sort of resilience and health from physical health, mental health, psychological health, financial health, as well as the future of work issues that, that folks have talked about um, so that we can continue to attract the workforce that we need in an environment where we can't offer the same sort of flexibility that, you know, that the private sector can in terms of working from home and working in your PJs. We don't do that. You got to come into work. Um, but we are, we're looking for ways to, um, to ensure that the agency is, continues to be able to both retain, to attract and retain this workforce we're going to need in the future. I'm now officially in the red. The clock's going the other way. Um, <laughs> okay. Are we, this is it. All right, so <laughs> if any of you have anything else you want to say, we're I at... I apologize for monopolizing the last minute, but I want to get that out. completely <laughs> okay. We're at 5425 <laughs> Wisconsin Avenue, Chevy Chase. You all come up. We'll feed you <laughs> anytime, your staff, and you can talk as long as you want. But I want to thank you all. I have to jump out now. Um, but I want to thank you so much for doing this uh, and the need for you 
for all of us to stay on stage. They want to take a photograph. Thank you all for coming, and just please give these folks a big hand, their staffs <laughs> and INSA. Well done, gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please welcome to the stage FCA Intelligence Committee Chair Bob Noonan and INSA President Suzanne Wilson Heckenberg. Thank you, JJ, for um, moderating a great panel. Thanks to all the leaders for your candor and, most importantly, your commitment to our nation, all that you do. So um, please join me, and in, in, in not only for these leaders here, but for all the leaders that gave their time so generously over the past couple of days, another round of applause for this great group of people. Thanks, Bob. And I fully appreciate I'm standing between people getting back to their offices or getting an early start on the weekend. But Bob, we genuinely appreciate the partnership we have here with FCA. We've certainly hit our stride. And so good seeing so many of our sponsors and exhibitors and attendees in person. I want to thank the INSA and FCA staffs, um, Lewis Shepard, John Doyen, Holly Morrell, Aaron Rosenthal, Gretchen Gunning, Toya Cribs, Tina Viscusio, and Peggy O'Connor, who are all integral in their roles today and yesterday here at the summit. And again, thank you for the partnership. All right. Uh, thanks also, Tish and, and Susan. Great job. Thanks, uh, great team. Thanks to all of you for your participation in that. Uh, lots of opportunities have been discussed out here, and I think it's a great chance to do what we all really want to do, and that's to participate in the team sport of defending this great country of ours. So thanks. Have a great AFSIA. It's uh, Intelligence and National Security Summit weekend. Stay safe. Thank you very much.